It's not a beer if you're listening to the uh, audio form. Welcome to the Morning Market Briefing. Uh, not yet. June 13th, 2022. I uh, hope everybody had a good weekend. Are you guys pumped for Monday or what? It'll be a good one. <laughs> I'm, trying to keep, a good I'm, I'm keeping a positive attitude. Yeah, we're going to try to stay upbeat here. Uh, meanwhile, bullet point one on the official show production notes is, and I quote, market collapse. Uh, ben, the S&P has closed at a low of 3,900 uh, intraday, low of 3,810 this year. Uh, how likely do you think it is that we hit and stay at an all-time yearly low? I guess a yearly low, not an all-time low today. I think it's probably, it's going to happen. I think so. I think probably greater than 70% chance it happens. Uh, <laughs> S&P 500 futures in intraday low of 37.97 overnight. Um, what you're seeing right now is you had the big sell-off after the CPI announcement on Friday, and then a lot of Europe was closed. Asia was obviously closed. And so those guys had to come in and readdress overnight, which meant that they sold all of their stocks. And then they had to sell American stocks. S&P 500 futures went down, and now we're pricing in more declines this year. So it just kind of rolls in on a, itself. And so you had the German DAX down 2.5%, the FTSE 100 down 1.5% in the UK, the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index down 3.5%. And you're seeing this trend, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, but there's just no liquidity out there. There aren't any buyers. And uh, obviously the central banks are not buyers right now. In fact, they're net sellers, or at least they were trying to let their balance sheets roll off. So if they're not providing liquidity to the market and the market has no liquidity because people do not want to buy into this. Yeah, people don't want to buy it. I mean, we kind of alluded to this on Friday, uh, just in what we're seeing with CPI data and our expectation for Wednesday. My hope, I guess, to an extent is that maybe uh, we'll get to what the Fed actually does on Wednesday, but that the action on Wednesday maybe spurs some buying. So hopefully we can get a little bit of strength there. But I mean, it's, it's ugly out there right now. Um, you know, again, looking at futures, uh, even Bitcoin's down. Uh, Bitcoin down 12%, uh, which I say that kind of as a joke. Um, Bitcoin does not store value. Uh, S&P down close to 3%. But I mean, that, that has some real ramifications. Oh, I mean, yeah. think, think, think of everyone who had Bitcoin who were buying the million dollar houses. They don't have that. I mean, they still have the Bitcoin, but it's, instead of being worth sixty thousand dollars of Bitcoin, it's worth less than twenty four thousand dollars today. Ethereum has gone from five thousand. I mean, so these people in crypto assets are really getting hit hard. Celsius Network is now pausing all withdrawals. They have over eleven billion dollars in customer assets. Um, they basically provide lending services in the form of cryptocurrency. So it's basically a bank for crypto. Uh, they were promising 18% yields, but now you can't get your money back. And this is what happens when there's a bank run. And it's exactly like, um, oh, it's if you've ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Uh, it's very similar to what happened in 1907, uh, where there was this panic. There was just no, uh, the deposits weren't guaranteed. Um, people couldn't get their money out of the bank. People can't get their money out of these uh, out of this Celsius network with this Bitcoin. And that's a microcosm of what we're seeing in the market right now. And I think that's having a real major impact both on the availability of capital, but then also confidence in the financial system. I mean, also, what was it, 45 days ago when Fidelity started allowing people to buy Bitcoin yeah. within their 401ks? Uh, and it was, what, 30 40% higher at that point? I mean, that's just a massive loss of wealth and, and, and capital. And what it really is, is it's a lot like Bernie Madoff, which is that people put money in and that allows people to get money out. But when people stop putting money in, it turns out there's nothing there. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing in Bitcoin is that that illusion of, of value uh, has been just removed from the market. People don't see it as a, as a real asset anymore. And I, and I contrast that with traditional investments. So traditional investments, what we do with stocks and bonds, you are owed money. There are businesses that are actually investing, creating wealth and paying out capital. Bitcoin, you put your money into a pot and they provide a yield on it, but there isn't any, there's no substance. There's no wealth actually being created. There's no additive uh, things going into the economy that's additive. So for that reason, there's, I mean, you should never have expected Bitcoin to make any money in the first place. Yeah. Congrats to those who did, but I don't know. I, yeah, but you know, they, they only tell you about it when it's up. They never talk about it right yeah, now, or yeah. they're still holding. Yeah, the Bitcoin fanboys, the stands are 
shockingly quiet right now. Uh, we do have PPI coming tomorrow. Inflation continues to seem quite persistent. We are seeing a little bit of relief on oil. I would be hesitant to read too much into that, though. I mean, oil is still a volatile commodity, even at an elevated price. I think that's partly a correlation effect that you're seeing today. And partly, US dollar is incredibly strong. So in other currencies, you're seeing oil about the same where, where it was. But I mean, the US dollar continues to strengthen against the euro, the pound, against the yen. I mean, it's just all over the place, um, which actually will be deflationary for the US at some point, because it means that uh, we have, if we have an extremely strong currency, it means that uh, of imported goods should be cheaper for us in US dollar terms. So that should be good news, um, but that'll take some time to filter through the system. All right, Tom, Fed announcement on Wednesday, market expectation uh, is up to 13.3 rate hikes for the year. We were at 10.3 just about 10 days ago. Uh, what are you expecting? I mean, I know, I think we've talked about this, but I think we would like to see more than just a double hike. Uh, what's the expectation right now? What do you think will happen? And I mean, what would you want to see? Honestly, you know, and this is probably one that would cause a lot of short-term pain. I think that the Fed should just go ahead and raise rates to the neutral rate. I think they should just do all 10, just go. <laughs> and I think that that would be net positive for the market. It would, it would really shock the bond market. It, but the fact of the matter is with the bond market, we own these bonds and they will eventually mature and it's not going to hurt their credit quality, but on paper, they will lose value. But I think for the stock market, it will be a show and a vote of confidence in the Fed saying, we're actually going to do whatever it takes to fix this inflation thing. Because right now it's just, we're not doing enough. It's clearly not working. Uh, we're doing a little, and you know, if we just keep kicking along at two rate hikes at the rate we're going, we're going to be at 10% inflation by the end of the summer. So I think that that's really what needs to be done. They need to pull the trigger and destroy the housing market and destroy the jobs market. And we'll pick up the pieces on the other side, but that's what's going to happen because otherwise it's going to happen either way, but it's going to be far more painful and far more <laughs> slow, uh, you know, and it's going to be inflation driven and not rates driven, which I think is important. But I can tell you that from the bond market perspective, the way things are moving, the market has no idea what the Fed is going to do. Because we've seen, I mean, I've never seen a formation like this on the yield curve in my career, which is that, you know, you basically got two high points, which is just over three years and 20 years. Those are the high points on the yield curve. So we basically got this weird, almost it's the yield bump, you know, it basically peaks shortly and it comes back down. Then you've got 20 year and then the 30 year. So nobody wants, for some reason, three and a half year bonds or 20 year bonds, uh, which is just such an unusual shape. I think, you know, my, my thinking is something needs to be done. No one's doing anything. The Fed has the most power to do something unexpected and policy wise that could really change this market and really get things right back on track. I don't think they're going to do that right now. Futures are indicating that there's a slight chance that they'll do three hikes, but probabilistically they're going to do two, um, you know, and two for the rest of the year equals 10. Then we're at 13. Uh, I just don't think I just don't think that they're going to do it, but they need to, uh, and I think it would be beneficial to the market, the stock market, especially uh, if they did do it. But I mean, you're seeing yields tick up all over the all over the world. I mean, the Swiss ninety days ago, the Swiss ten year was at thirty three basis points. It's at one seventeen now, so it's basically quadded up in ninety days. Uh, Europe is selling off just exceptionally on their bonds, uh, so we're you know we're in a tough spot. Bonds have sold off a little bit. We're just over the lows of the year. I mean, we're just kind of ticked down a little bit past the low point so far, but we're still holding up exceptionally compared to the rest of the world. Uh, so there is definitely some silver lining there. And I think that's going to push demand towards the U.S., help us stay stable. Um, but this is just, I mean, who knows what could happen with the Fed? I, something really needs to be done. I don't think they're going to do it, but I think that there's a, call it a 15% chance that they'll do something dramatic and positive for the markets. I just, I just don't know that they'll do it. Yeah, I think one thing just as a reminder to clients that are on the call on the on the bond pricing thing. I mean, it's we say this over and over, but on fixed income, we make the money on the buy. We're going to hold that stuff till it matures. You're going to see prices fluctuate. We've had a number of years. Tom and I were talking about this this morning. We've had a number of years where, despite a low interest rate environment and some volatility, uh, fixed income has posted a paper return that was quite significant. 
the bonds we hold that we continue to review and we continue to monitor are going to perform exactly as we expected them to perform when we bought them. So even if you see a statement loss, stick with us, understand that we're making sure they're still making their coupon payments twice a year. We're making sure we're keeping eyes on credit. If you don't need cash, uh, let's try to stay tight on those and, and kind of stay positioned. But that creates the challenge, obviously, on you know being disciplined asset allocations. I mean, when everything's down in, in a weird way, it kind of helps that stocks are down too. You know, it, it's not great, but... I don't know, I'm trying to find positivity here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ben, um, when we talk about liquidity and how it's just kind of disappearing, where would you kind of attribute that? This is what the, the sources? this is what the Federal Reserve does not yet, which I would argue is the Federal Reserve's most important priority, and that's to maintain liquidity in the market. And I thought they did a good job in, in March 2020. I think they've done poor jobs for the better half of the last 20 years. Um, Look, let's look at mortgage-backed securities, for example. Mortgage-backed securities, even before the Fed went like all out at the end of March 2020, there had been a week where no one was buying mortgages. Um, at this time, rates were threes, twos, and SunTrust wouldn't take, when it was still SunTrust, they wouldn't take mortgages for less than five. Now, now five obviously looks attractive, but the point being, no one wants to step into mortgages right now. And the Fed is not doing anything. In fact, they're actually letting some of those mortgages run off their balance sheet. Um, there was a mortgage broker called Lou Barnes. He said, during the last 44 years, my days have begun and ended with a mortgage market. Four painful moments stand out today. Last Friday makes five. Uh, yes, on Friday, they jumped 20 basis points to 5.78%, according to bank rate. I wouldn't be surprised to see them hit 6% today. Um, and, and right now, there's no one buying these things because one, people don't have the capital. They'd have to sell something else to buy it. And number two, who wants to step in front of the, the Federal Reserve right now? So in my opinion, I agree with Tom. I, I think that the Fed should raise rates fairly aggressively, but I think they should marry that with pausing on this, on this quantitative tightening program because they are actively withdrawing liquidity from the market and people need liquidity just to stabilize markets. Otherwise, you're going to completely go the other direction. You can tighten policy, um, but quantitative tightening in this market, do not do it because you are removing liquidity when there is no liquidity already in the market. You are removing the entire reason the Federal Reserve exists. Um, let's look at Bitcoin. I mean, we just talked about this and it, it would happen to banks if the Federal Reserve was not there. This is why the Federal Reserve was created. It was created after 1907 and there was no Federal Reserve and he needed the JP Morgan, the guy who the bank is named after, to actually step in and you know, secure the economy and say, JP Morgan will not let this country fail. And that's what happened. And then the Federal Reserve was created, for, designed for that purpose. Uh, but right now the Federal Reserve is actively acting against that purpose. Um, it kind of reminds me, the absence of leadership right now, both from the Fed and from Congress, reminds me very much so of my first week of college in 2008. It was last week of September. There was a bill on the table, $700 billion rescue package. Congress didn't understand the urgency of the problem, the gravity of the problem. They did not pass the bill. I think it was like by 15 votes or something. And it was, the theatrics were unbelievable yeah. at the time. Um, Everyone was watching C-SPAN, uh, watching the vote come in. I remember watching it in my macroeconomics class. It didn't pass, Dow fell 7%. What do you know, three days later, the bill passed. Um, so my point being, there needs to be something to spur the Fed and Congress into action. Maybe today will be it. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's there's a path out. I mean, it's. I don't think anybody at this table, and I hope, nobody anywhere i mean we kind of laughed last week about how people were kind of like i mean oh i could see a recession maybe coming even the rosiest people i don't think are expecting that soft landing anymore um i think at best the base case expectation is a slow crash <laughs> a slow landing um but I don't know that the narrative has necessarily changed. Many make a great point. I don't know that our view of what's going on has really changed over the last couple of weeks. It's more that the market's 
now seeing it, I don't say that to say, oh, like we were right. They were wrong. We saw this way before anybody else. I, I mean that to say like this seemed a bit inevitable. Um, and I think if people were honest about the inflation piece, this kind of always seemed like this was how it was going to go. The biggest concern I have, I and mean, I hear Tom loud and clear on, um, you know, wanting the Fed to really take meaningful action. I'd love to see something like that on Wednesday. I would certainly be encouraged by it. I'd like to think equity markets would be as well. My biggest concern is I, I continue to come back to the jobs piece, and I continue to think that's the only thing this administration and leadership are currently hanging their hat on. And I don't know how willing they are to let that get ugly. And, and they and they don't admit the fact that jobs are going to go negative either way. I mean, the cat's out of the bag on that. Um, my and, and maybe they have to see kind of the what what's actually happening to actually do something about it. Problem is we're trying to solve a lot of these issues, not with the, the, the right solutions, but with band-aids. Um, we're, not, we're not actually treating the, the root cause of it. I, I would pivot and say, what is happening today is necessary. We need to be pricing in more rate hikes in the market because one, that will give Fed, the Fed cover because if the market is already expecting I know we've talked about 14 rate hikes. Um, I don't know why I'm anchored to that. I think maybe it's because Bullard said it, uh, you know, a month ago before he turned dovish and it'll probably turn hawkish again. Um, but I've been pinpointing 14 rate hikes. And that's when we we're at 10. I think we're now at 13 and a quarter. So, you know, that's a positive. Um, the other positive is oil prices are down, if only a little bit today. Yield curve did invert. All of these things are necessary, but not sufficient conditions to have the market bottom. Um, now, I, what, is, what does that mean? Um, does it mean we're buying aggressively? No, but it does mean that these are conditions that have to be met before we can have a bottom and we're getting closer to that. And I, I would just say, um, if there is an encouraging takeaway, it's that we're still afloat. Um, the, sail, the sailboat is still sailing. Um, we've trimmed the sails. And we're, we're on the course and we're, we're sailing through this thing. And um, this is what it looks like. And we're getting through it. And um, you go from there. But, th but this is a necessary condition in order to get to the other side is what has to happen. Yeah, we've got a question coming in uh, from the chat here uh, from John. The, the Fed should be full of highly educated people thinking from their perspective. Why would their thought process be different? Perhaps at ours. I, th I think their process is extremely academic and um, frankly, a bit of group think. They have a 200 economists who, who work there. They're modeling um, this stuff out, but they don't model these jump conditions because jump conditions can't be modeled the way they do it uh, with like those stochastic processes. So um, they find it difficult to now model a jobs, let's like, say the jobs coming at 500,000 job losses this month. They're not going to have that in their models. They're not going to have, they obviously didn't have the inflation jump from 1% to 8.5% persistently. So that's what, that's what they miss. And, and the, but, the, but the main piece of it is that they don't understand because they haven't operated in it. They don't have the learned experience. They don't understand market functioning. And, and, and what liquidity means and, and how that can actually determine the reality. It's called like this reflexive reality that's created by the market. I mean, if the market goes down, people get more concerned. They buy less stuff. I mean, it's, that's a reflexive thing. So then the market goes down further. And I don't think they adapt well to that because it doesn't fit their classic economic models. It's yeah. actually super similar to what we were talking about with uh, crypto holders five minutes ago in their mind, they don't realize that if no one's putting money in, you can't get money out because all they have seen in their, regardless of how disciplined, I mean, and there's people out there, we bash the crypto bros a lot, but there are people out there that are running pretty sophisticated modeling on this. They don't realize when things get bad, they actually make themselves get worse. And those things start to compound and they don't have any real ability or model to anticipate that. And I mean, I think I think the 
fed is so unbelievably academic and removed really from two cr crucial portions of the population. One is the general population. I don't think they, you know, when Janet Yellen, who, you know, obviously not in the fed now, but, you know, as treasury secretary, when she comes out and she says, I just didn't think inflation would possibly go on this path. Like, where has she been that she didn't think that even if she's not reading a newspaper, not reading the wall street journal, like everyday people are like, yeah, inflation. It's there and it's high. So they're totally removed from the general population to where they don't really have a grasp on what's actually happening. So they're constantly having to react. And they're very removed from people like ourselves who actually interact in the market all day. I mean, they're incredibly detached from that. And yeah. it's all theoretical. Um, there's a lack of skin in the game. Yeah, They don't have to not. look anybody in the eye and say, I picked the wrong stock. I picked the wrong bond. I made the wrong decision. They don't have to look anybody in the eye and do that. Congress people who have no idea what they're talking about, sometimes they have to go testify, but that's about it. It's almost like, you know, fantasy football owners, you know, like you can do all the modeling and stuff. You can pick out the best players, but ultimately they're human beings and they may not perform. And I think that's kind of what they do. They're, they're sitting here thinking like, oh, well, the model says that the economy should do X, Y, Z, but then we get a gap down here or an unexpected print and the model doesn't line up and they're like, oh, well, you know, I did all my research. So this is, this is outside of the realm of possibilities and they take no responsibility. I mean, it sounds right. dumb, but like, I mean, I always point to Jamie Dimon. I feel like he has an unbelievable pulse on what's actually happening, not only at his bank, not only in the financial services sector, not only in the market, but also kind of with the consumer. Um, if the fed was run by a bunch of bank CEOs, it'd be run much better. I mean, that's a fact. I can't prove it, but it's a fact. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're just run by a bunch of stuffy old, economists and it can, like if you ever take an economics class it is not what it's like to actually manage money it's not even no. close i mean you can get a finance degree and come out and have no idea how to trade bonds or trade stocks and it yeah, is, they're, they're not related one's theoretical and the other is practical and they're yeah, two different things i mean it's like one of the most commonly iterated phrases is like the economy is not the stock market we say that all the time they don't know that I mean, I watch a lot of golf. I have a lot of opinions on how to play golf, but I can't do it like the pros. Yeah. You know, those two, two things are totally different. All right. Well, <laughs> this was a fun, this was a yeah. fun one. Um, uh, let's leave on an optimistic note, Ben. What's the one thing people should be optimistic about? I think that we're getting closer to 14. I think 14 is the number. 14 implied rate hikes were at 13.3. Um, gas prices, oil prices are down a little bit today. Dollar is strong. You know, we've said it before, but um, I don't know. If you're looking for signs that inflation is peaked, today is the day that this is helping to show that inflation is peak. Um, it's one day. You know, that's, that, 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 that's, that's your silver lining, but we got a long way to go. Yeah, I think mine, I just kind of, we do this a lot with people who are close to retirement or in retirement. Start thinking about money as a function of time. Um, you know, we're down 10% over the last 12 months, seven and a half of that's come in the last five days, uh, on the S and P just be mindful. I mean, this is, it's, it hurts. It's painful. We trust us. Like we are not taking it lightly, but it's also one of those things where is it unfathomable that the market would be down, you know, 20% in six months now? I mean, that's, embedded within the models we do for clients it's embedded in the asset allocation assumptions as painful as it is and we certainly hear you it's a big part of why we do these calls while we're doing the memos that we're sending out on email on friday um we want people to understand that we're looking at the stuff and when i say we're comfortable with it i don't mean that we enjoy it but i don't think this is the time to panic and change strategies um i think this is the time to you know, stay disciplined and realize, hey, this is always within the realm of possibility. Yeah, I think it's just important to remember when things are bad, they feel a lot worse maybe than they are. And then once they're gone, you almost never think about them again. You know, and you think back to March 2020, and it's sort of almost like, man, that was really rough. But everybody got through it. We came back. We're going to get through this one as well. It's just important to remember that when things are when things are tough, they, they always get better and you never feel as bad as you did when you were actually in it. And so I think just 
you know, we just got to keep grinding. You know, we're not picking companies that are going to go bust. We're picking ones that are going to weather it through. They may not have the best price action, but we're going to get through this thing on the other side. Yep. All right. We'll wrap it up there. We'll be back tomorrow for more therapy at 830 and uh, talk to you guys soon.